Some historical stories are so great that they're almost beyond the current imagination. And the story of the unification of Japan in the 16th century is one of them. It's really one of the most amazing stories, I would argue, in the history of the world, where you took a world or a, a country that was just wrapped in violence for over a century, and over about a 40 year period, unified it and created a period of peace that lasted more or less for 250 years. Um, what I'm gonna talk about right now is the story of the first step of that, the process of going from really chaos and nonstop warfare to relative peace and unification. And then later we'll study the bigger question that we're really thinking about that we've also thought about in the context of China, which is how is it that once you establish unification or you establish peace that you maintain that peace and you maintain power. To give a little bit of background, Japan entered a period known as the Sengoku Jidai or the period of the Warring States in about the year 1467. Warring States is a little bit of a misnomer. You might think of it more as almost warring counties. And what had happened before 1467, there was relative peace um, and dominance of rule of the Shogun with some regard for the emperor in Japan. And in 1467, that broke apart. And for about a hundred years, it was nonstop warfare in which relatively low or mid-level or even upper level samurai or soldiers known as daimyo who held a certain amount of land and territory would compete for power with one another. So that if you get to the year, say 1560, and it's really from the year 1560 to 1600 when Japan unified, somebody who'd been born around the year 1560, not only would they have never have known peace, their father and mother would have never known peace, grandfather and grandmother, and if they were still alive, which was unlikely, great-grandfather and great-grandmother. In other words, nobody on in the island chains of Japan who was around in 1560 would have ever known or known anybody who had ever known a world that was not a world of warfare. By the year 1600, that would all change. How that changed is something that historians still argue about. And those who look at the importance of individuals really point to the importance of three individuals. And that's the story I'm going to tell to talk about the political dynamics of how this all worked. And those three great in individuals were all born around the, the same time between the years of 1534 and 1543. Um, and their names were Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. All three of them were born in a portion of what was today known as Aichi Prefecture around the same time. And Oda was the first of them to come to power. And the three of them who all worked together, Oda was the first leader and then Hideyoshi and then Tokugawa, and they were all loyal to one another, had different methods of ruling. And there's a famous apocryphal tale that really sort of summarizes their approach to leading and ruling. And it goes like this. It says, somebody went up to Oda Nobunaga and he said, if you had a songbird and that songbird would, wouldn't sing, what would you do? He said, I would take it by its neck. I would crush its neck till its brain burst out of its head. And that in many ways epitomizes the way that Oda Nobunaga ruled and fought is he would wanna find his enemies. He would wanna defeat them. And then he would wanna put them to death. Toyotomi Hideyoshi was asked the same question. And he said, I would take that songbird I would squeeze its neck so tight that it was incredible pain, but allow it to live until it gave in to my will and would follow me. And in many ways, that's apocryphal of the way Hideyoshi would go about winning and ruling. He would defeat his enemies. He would put tremendous pressure on them until they gave in, but he wouldn't necessarily put them to death. And finally, they went to Tokugawa Ieyasu and they asked the same question. And he said, I would patiently hold that bird in my hands and wait until it gave in and sang its beautiful song. And again, that's apocryphal of the way that Tokugawa, at least over simplistically ruled, in that he would, of course, beat his enemies, but he would look for political rather than military solutions to try to create unity and maintain his power. Now, all of that, of course, is an oversimplification, um, as certainly Hideyoshi had vast political skills and Ieyasu certainly used death and, and warfare to create his power. But, but it's a good symbol of the way to think about the three of them. The basic story goes like this. From about 1467 till about the 1560s, you have nonstop warfare between these little, the daimyo who, who run these areas that are about the size of counties or states, if you think of it in terms of the United States. 
And at that time, contrary to the myth of the samurai having this great loyalty to those above them, it's a period where there's constant fighting even within samurai clans, where it's whoever is most powerful and most skilled is that who should rule. And often those who are immediately below, who might be considered vassals in the feudalistic terminology, which is kind of out of fashion among scholars of Japan these days, would often try to overthrow the person above them. And that any alliances were only as strong as the ability of the people who made the alliances to force the other member of the alliance to keep the alliance. In other words, people would constantly stab one another in the back, would stab the person above them in the back, um, and everything was, was kind of uh, very chaotic. Along this time, Oda Nobunaga with um, Hideyoshi and Tokugawa Ieyasu closely allied with him, started to lead his armies and win bigger and bitter, bigger battles and take over more and more of central Japan. Um, and between about 1560 um, until his death in 1582, he got to control much of central Japan, including much of the area around Kyoto, which is uh, the, the key area where the, the capital was at that time. Um, the way he did it though, as I said, was brutal. So for instance, when he looked at his rivals, many of his rivals were daimyo, or other samurai, but another great political group and a very powerful military group were the Buddhists, right? There's often a myth within especially the Western world that Buddhism is just about peace and meditation and things like that. The reality is in Japanese history, there were strands of peace and meditation and Buddhism was an important religious group, but the Buddhist monasteries, many of the Buddhist monasteries were often important political, economic and military groups and Buddhist soldiers were very powerful soldiers. And so to typify the way that Nobunaga would go about unifying when he would fight an enemy is one of the strongest adversaries he had was the Buddhist monastery at the top of Mount Hiei. And so when you get to, um, oh, sorry, 1570s, in 1571, Nobunaga decided he was going to attack Mount Hiei and he's going to make, lay siege on it. The Buddhist monks who were the soldiers, they were all male soldiers, knew this. And the monastery itself was at the top of the mountain. So what they did when they knew that Nobunaga and his troops were approaching, and they knew they might lose, even though they were fierce warriors, is they sent all the women and the children and the babies up to the top of the mountain. And they met Nobunaga's troops really more down towards the bottom. And they fought and Nobunaga's troops beat the Buddhist monk soldiers, killed all of them, and then proceeded up to the top of the mountain. Nobody was allowed to surrender. When he went up to the top of the mountain, the women and children and babies were locked inside, or not locked, but were inside the monastery, which was an all wooden building. As a sign of the brutality of Nobunaga, him wanting to give a sign that you must give in to him, or more than must give in to him, that you must fear him, he proceeded to burn down the monastery with everybody in it. And as the people ran out, the women and the children and the babies, they caught each and every one of them and killed each and every member of the Mount Hiei Buddhist community to send a symbol to everybody to fear Oda Nobunaga. And that in many ways is the way Oda went about defeating people, is he beat them so that they would give in and he would get complete control of the territories. The downside of that approach, of course, is that it gives no incentive for his opponents to, to give in to him, because even if they give in, um, he's just going to put them to death. Nobunaga continued to have a series of, of victories until up until about 1582. Um, and in 1582, as he was laying siege in, in another battle, actually one of his own underlings, um, Akechi Mitsuhide, who had actually been one of his key people in the siege of Mount Hiei, turned on him and, and attacked him, wounded him quite badly, at which point Oda Nobunaga committed ritual suicide and died in 1582. Following his death, his death was avenged by, by other of his followers, um, and Toyotomi Hideyoshi was able to take control of the, the groups that used to be loyal to Oda Nobunaga. Over the next 10 years from 1582 to about 1590, 1592, um, Toyotomi Hideyoshi through a series of both military and political maneuvers managed to get semi-control of pretty much all of the main island of Japan and much of, of Kyushu and Shikoku. 
and became really the leader of Japan. And at that point, from 1590, 91 on, Japan is actually unified under Hideyoshi's rule. Hideyoshi did it through a combination of, of course, brutal and vicious military attacks and military victories. But unlike Nobunaga, if somebody would surrender to Hideyoshi, he often actually allowed them to maintain their power. Not as much power as before, but he would often even allow them to remain a daimyo um, and to keep some land, um, keep power, so that there was a lot of incentive for people to turn their loyalties, former enemies, to become loyal followers, or at least semi-loyal followers of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. So by about 1590, um, almost all the daimyo in Japan have pledged their loyalty to Hideyoshi. And at that point, you could say Japan is semi-unified. Hideyoshi then actually went through a series of brilliant political maneuvers. And many of the aspects of the Japanese political system that we often say started to exist under the Tokugawa rule, which comes next, actually were put in place under Hideyoshi. So for example, it's under Hideyoshi that those um, who were not samurai or who were not leading samurai, where Hideyoshi said, well, if you're not a samurai, then you shouldn't have a sword. And his reason for doing this is if less people obviously have swords, then there are less people who can attack the samurai who are above them. So it was actually Hideyoshi who um, gave the famous edict that said, unless you're a samurai, you, might, you may not have weapons, right? It was also Hideyoshi who gave the famous edicts that said things like, um, you should stay in your own domain. You can't just move wherever you want within Japan, which created a lot more stability in Japan, right? Um, it was Hideyoshi who created, at least it was really semi-fluid, but the idea that you would be part of a, a, a class system, you'd be a samurai or a peasant or an artisan or a merchant. It's of course a little bit more complicated than that in reality, but he created many of those ideas that started to create that system. Um, he of course became shogun and he actually started to put a, a bureaucracy in place that Tokugawa would very much build on and, and make much stronger and, and really renew in many ways. Um, Hideyoshi actually may have created a dynasty except that he, he had some really bad ideas that would lead to his downfall, that the downfall, of, not to him, but of his family. Um, once he created the unification of Japan, what happens is in 1592, he decides that he wants to go on some overseas adventures. And between 1592 and 1598, he goes on a series of attacks of the Korean Peninsula. Um, these attacks, while he does have some wins there, they actually don't go very well. He, he doesn't get control of the Korean Peninsula. And while many soldiers and samurai make sacrifices to fight for him in Korea, since he doesn't win, he doesn't have any way to reward them, which is the typical way that a samurai would keep his vassals loyal is by when they win, giving them some type of land or something of economic value. He couldn't do that in Korea. Um, so he spent a tremendous amount of power and money trying to take over Korea. He also got very worried about heirs. And when he first comes into power and unifies Japan, he actually had no children of his own. So he had, there was the idea that some of his nephews, one of his nephews might take over his reign when he died. Um, but he did eventually have a son. And once he had a son, he actually put to death all other potential male heirs, all of his nephews that would have been around him so that only his son was left so that he thought there would be no rival to um, his son to take power after he passed away. When Hideyoshi died in 1598, his son was still a young child um, and five of his closest followers, including Tokugawa Ieyasu, were standing around him. And he asked them all to pledge to make sure that they would protect his son and make sure that his son became the next shogun of Japan. And of course, they all promised that while Hideyoshi was on his deathbed. Um, when Hideyoshi passed away in 1598, it took barely any time for those five to start to plot against each other to try to create unification of Japan. Um, there were then a series of battles. And at the end, a series of battles and alliances made so that at the end, you get to the year 1600. Um, and there's a great battle called the Battle of Sekigahara um, in which Tokugawa Ieyasu and his followers win. And at that point, you've actually really unified Japan under Tokugawa Ieyasu. Um, and I will tell that story of what Tokugawa Ieyasu did with the understanding that one of the biggest things he did is when he won that battle, he actually took many of the people who defeated him and he continued to make them powerful daimyo 
afterwards as long as they would remain loyal to him. Um, so he then proceeded after the year 1600 in the Battle of Sekigahara to really put in place a system of government that would maintain peace and stability in Japan um, for over two centuries. So you see this amazing transformation from a world of nonstop warfare to a world of really nonstop peace and stability. And in my next video, I will tell that story of the system that Tokugawa Ieyasu and his heirs put in place that allowed him to rule without just using constant fear and military strength. Thank you for listening.